Hello and welcome to Pitt Street Research. My name is Stuart Roberts and I'm one of the co-founders of our firm. And joining me on the morning of, on the afternoon, I should say, of Monday, the 18th of March, 2024 from Melbourne is Dr. Nina Webster, who is the CEO of Dimerix, ASX DXB. Nina, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now is a good time to be Dr. Nina Webster because Dimerix has just read out its first interim analysis from the uh, uh, phase three study of um, DMX 200 in focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And uh, lo and behold, you've hit your primary endpoints. Uh, well done. Thank you, Stuart. Yes, it's been a very exciting couple of weeks. Uh, as you noted, we announced last week that the first interim analysis in focus, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is a rare type of kidney disease, was successful in that, that first interim analysis in that proteinuria endpoint in 72 patients, which is a magnitude bigger than our phase two study. Right. Um, so the this is not the the money shot yet. We've got a second interim analysis where the the uh, FDA has guided that they would be willing to accept um, uh, accept a filing at that point for accelerated approval. Um, let's talk about that second interim analysis point and, and speculate about when that could be, and then we'll come back to your um, your initial data that you announced last week. Um, what's the second interim analysis, and, and how long do we get there, roughly? Yeah, so the second interim analysis um, is is a, an interim analysis that also looks at proteinuria, same as we've just looked at now, but also looks at kidney function called EGFR, or glomerular filtration rate. It's just the, the rate at which it processes the urine. Um, those two are the endpoints in the second interim analysis. Now, subject to recruitment, recruitment is going well. Uh, we would anticipate that being around the middle of 2025, so not far away at all. Right. If that looks really compelling, there may be an opportunity to submit for what's called accelerated or conditional marketing approval at that point. Right. But the, the good news is that um, obviously EGFR is a, is a harder endpoint. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, the folks at FDA and elsewhere have looked at the various endpoints that you could use and, and realized that's the most reliable one. But protein urea pre gives us a good indication that this thing could work in EGFR, it's fair to say. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, EGFR takes longer to see because the slope is a slow change. So if you go too early, you're not going to see the change. That's right. why there has to go to the full two years to be able to see the full EGFR outcome. But protein urea is a far quicker endpoint. And that's basically, if we just, just touch very quickly on why protein in the urine or protein urea, that's because a healthy kidney is a really, really good filter. So a healthy person should have no protein in the urine at all. Right. When a person gets a damaged kidney, like in FSGS, that kidney becomes quite leaky and you end up with protein spilling from the blood into the urine. And that amount of protein in the urine is an indication of the rate of your kidney disease progression. So the more protein you're in, the, the quicker your kidney is failing. So if we can reduce the protein in the urine, it says that we are slowing down the rate of kidney disease progression. Right, which brings us back to the um, uh, interim analysis that you were able to read out last week. Um, with uh, a, a great amount of statistical significance, you are uh, markedly reducing uh, proteinuria in the treated patients. So what we've done is we've just done that first, first interim analysis of proteinuria endpoint in the first 72 patients, exactly as you said. We've used that statistical model to demonstrate that DMX200 is performing better than placebo in reducing that protein in the urine, which is that surrogate marker of kidney disease. So the aim of this is to really confirm that what we were seeing in the phase two, which was about eight patients, relatively small, that's not unusual for a rare disease, is could be replicated in a much bigger cohort in 72 patients. So we're really absolutely delighted that we're on track and we think we've had we've added significant value to that opportunity what else pleasantly surprised you when you look at the numbers coming back from your investigators well we don't see the actual numbers Stuart because it's what's called a blinded analysis yes. that's really yes. important uh, because if we see that data we cannot use those 72 patients in the end of the study right. it's a blinded analysis only the independent committee look at that they assess it using that statistical model and they report back to us that yes we've met that and we should proceed because we are seeing that difference between drug and placebo that we would expect. Right. So the only way I can find that data is somehow break into um, uh, the the uh, data room somewhere and steal it. And in which case, the, the vaults are coming after yes. you, right? Even right. I don't see it. The FDA does not see it. It is a, a blinded analysis so that we can preserve what's called the integrity of the study. Right. Um, so investors shouldn't be uh, uh, jumping for joy just yet. But on the other hand, we can be reasonably confident that we're on track to a decent uh, number next year when the EGFR uh, uh, data becomes available. That's right. It's about that confidence in what we would see uh, potentially at the end. 
And you put that into context with a capital raise that we just completed. We're in such a strong position for negotiating with potential partners now. Uh, obviously, we licensed Europe last year, 230 million, which we think is probably around 20% of the opportunity, 80% left to go. Um, and with this data, we really think uh, it puts us in a strong negotiating position. Right. And I'd, I'd highlight something from uh, previous discussions that you and I have had publicly as well. The big opportunity here is China. Ordinarily, one needs to jump through certain hoops to get into the Chinese market. You've already had um, uh, some feedback from uh, China's answer to the FDA that they would be happy with the data you've already got, plus add in some Chinese patients on top of that. So we could be talking um, uh, a much easier path to uh, approval in China than a lot of uh, other uh, drug developers have. Yeah, that's right. So when we look at the, the global opportunity, we think US is probably up 50%, so it's the biggest opportunity. But to your point, China has a really large kidney issue, kidney problem. And so uh, they're desperately seeking treatments for kidney disease in China. One of the key advantages we had when we went to talk to the NMPA, which is the FDA equivalent in, in China, is that they have confirmed that the study that we're doing at the moment could be appropriate for approval in China as well. So no need for an, a secondary or independent study after this one. This could be it for all of the territories, US, Europe, and China. Right. Now, this has not been the easiest trial in the world to organize. It ends up being roughly one um, uh, clinical trial site for every patient, given that uh, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, FSGS, is a, is a rare disease. And yet uh, we're, we're doing reasonably well on, on uh, recruitment by your guidance. Yes, that's right. So to recruit the first 72 patients, we had 70 sites open in 11 different countries. Now that we've passed that first interim analysis, we're actually proceeding into part two of the study and we're opening additional sites in both new and existing countries, including China. And it's those sites that will help support not just potential registration in those territories, but it'll also enhance recruitment. We are one of the fastest, if not the fastest, FSGS recruiting studies in the world at the moment. So that's a, a great, uh, great number to be looking at. We announced last week we've dosed 94. So we're already well on our way to that 144 endpoint. Yeah. Now, of course, some people are going to be saying if we recruit really, really quickly, then we'll be able to read out data sooner. It, it doesn't quite work like that because of the, uh, the the time limit one needs to wait in terms of the dosing before patients are available for evaluation, right? It, of a sort. So once we recruit the 144th patient, that is like the flag in the sand for when you count 35 weeks for that first outcome. Right. So the quicker you get the 144th patient in, the quicker that you could do that readout as well. Right, but it, it, but to to be to to allow yourself some wiggle room, let's just consider it's it's the middle of next year. Sometimes when we finally get that uh, that that number, um, potentially, uh, if, if you play your cards right, you've got more than a single partnership as you've got uh, at, at the moment, um, an accelerated approval into the uh, into the U.S. market potentially, uh, and um, the 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 opportunity to then move uh, DMX two hundred into other indications. Uh, you and I were talking before we recorded about uh, IgA nephropathy which is not FSGS, but it's a similar uh, uh, disease of, of kidney function decline treated at the moment with um, with blood pressure uh, drugs, which where you'd be a, a, a good opportunity for, right? Uh, that, that's right. I think uh, we can never make promises of what those future indications will be, Stuart. But um, to your point, uh, that we target what's called the CCR2 pathway. That's the inflammatory pathway, and we interrupt the inflammatory signal. And there are so many different diseases that involve that inflammatory pathway that that is a potential follow-on for us. So diseases such as IgA nephropathy could be a potential for us in the future. Right. But uh, we're within a year of, of some potentially some very big things happening. No surprises then, uh, in retrospect, you were able to get this placement away at a premium to 30-day uh, VWAP just recently and raise a, a pretty cool 20 million. So uh, you and your colleagues uh, in, in the company must be quite pleased with how things are going. We, we are. And I think this is where we've taken a lot of that risk off the table. There's no question that we're funded uh, for the study, uh, which again takes away a lot of that risk moving forward with our part two uh, we'd have a pro forma cash position now using the December quarter of 35 million, just shy of 35 million, puts us in a great position, not just to fund the study, but also to negotiate with potential partners. Right. Um, what else is going to be keeping you awake in the next 12 months or so? Uh, well, making sure recruitment is on track. That's going to be the number one uh, capacity. I think, you know, one of the key things that we've built at Dimerics is a really, really strong team, very capable team. They've done done it, done this before taken products right through to market. So now we have to replicate that. So we're in a really good place at the moment, Stuart. We have to just get down and deliver on it now and make sure we get that outcome as quickly as we can. Okay, well, Nina Webster, 
you and your colleagues, uh, well done on getting this far. It's always good to see companies getting into the late stage and, and the programs are doing doing well. And um, I just wish we could get in a time machine and go forward and see how things are going next year. But uh, that technology so is to emerge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you, yeah. Stuart. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining Pitt Street Research. Thank you.